within our solar system, obviously, like, you know, there's planets that we're trying to figure out if at some point we could reach, but they're so far away. You know, are there definitive cases to be able to say that not necessarily aliens or something like that, but there's some life on Jupiter, for example? But if that number, so it's 0 0.005, if that number had said 0 0.00000005, you might be like, oh, okay. It, it depends on how you do it. Because I could just keep adding things onto the, you know, like a okay, lift 225, um, British, uh, blood type. Um, I don't know, the fact that I'm right footed. You just, you just keep adding like more and more stuff. Um, my, pres my eye prescriptions, uh, 3.25. So you just keep adding stuff on right. and you would end up with ridiculous probabilities. It just, it just depends on how, how much you engineer it. So a P value alone isn't meaningful. Um, if you really want it to do something surprising, it's got to do something unnatural. It's not unnatural for an object to pass near to a planet. That's not unnatural. Right. If it came to a full stop, if it just went sh boop, and just stopped in space, went backwards that's um, not natural when, then we'd be like hold on that is freaking weird that's not that has to be a ship i would agree with avi that that has to be a ship yeah. it is not doing any of that stuff everything it's doing is what asteroids and comets do okay number five its gas plume contains much more nickel than iron as found in industrial pr produced nickel alloys and a nickel to cyanide ratio that is orders of magnitude larger than that of all known comets, including 2i Borisov, with a likelihood below 1%. All right, let's take that out of the Japanese. Yeah, so it's it's uh, when you do this spectroscopy of these objects, uh, we talked about the different molecules you can detect coming off it. So we know there's water coming off it, which is obviously very typical of a mm -hmm. comet. There's also tons of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. Again, totally normal for a comet to do that kind of stuff. Um, and another kind of trace, you know, there's trace metals which come off as well. So there's iron and nickel and other things. Um, and the ratio of nickel to iron is, is super high. So that's kind of odd. It's producing tons of nickel and hardly any iron at all. Mm. Um, so that was the anomaly that Abby's talking about. And that is genuinely quite weird. We haven't really seen any comet. There's no known comet asteroid which produces this extreme ratio that's been observed for this object. Um, however, we did, again, we observed it at kind of a weird time. It's, it's pretty rare that we observe comets this far out in the solar system. It's just because this is like the celebrity object. We've been giving it so much attention. So it's possible there's actually a ton of objects we've just not been doing this for that it does this. Mm. The other interesting thing is if you look at the papers of these detections, They've been monitoring it all the way from uh, an AU, by the way, a dist is a unit of distance. That's the distance from the Earth to the Sun, one AU. Mm -hmm. um, we've been monitoring this comet from about three AU into about two AU and measuring how much nickel it's got all the way along that journey. Hey guys, if you haven't already subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. It's a huge, huge help. Thank you. And what we're seeing is that it started out really extreme and it's getting more and more normal as it gets closer and closer in. And the prediction is actually, as it gets closer to the sun, it will be indistinguishable from other comets, the mm. ratio. So again, this kind of speaks to the fact we caught this guy so early that it looks weird to us, but that's maybe just because we don't normally observe things at this part of the journey. And as it's gone closer and closer to the sun, it actually looks indistinguishable in terms of its nickel emission. So. It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty hard to like really know how anomalous this truly is because it, it's the, the very nature of our observations on it are kind of anomalous. How much attention it's got is anomalous. So the deeper you dig, the, you know, you get all this extreme finely grained detail, but it's not obvious um, whether these things are true for other comets or not. Um, and the other thing is, this is obviously the third interstellar object. So there's only three. There's really only two other objects to compare to, if you're being really honest yeah. about it. So uh, to say it's got, an, yeah, it's got an extreme nickel compared to solar system objects, but it's not a solar system object. So solar why are we miles. even like really comparing to that anyway? We know that exoplanets are freaking weird compared to the Earth's, the, the solar system planets. So why would we expect comets from other star systems to look the same as comets we have here? There's no reason why that should be so. By the way, you had said this earlier, but it was just coming up in the context of what you were explaining there. When you talk about 3i Atlas entering our solar system, so it's within the same galaxy, but it's coming from a different solar system, which is effectively coming from a different star system. So something, another equivalent of the sun somewhere else. How, how does that happen? Does it just float in or is there something that needs to happen for it to be able to leave another solar system and come to ours? I'm thinking like, you know, are there gravitational pools working against it? What's the science there? Yeah, I mean, we know there are ways of 
ejecting stuff out of the solar system even. Um, the solar system most likely probably had a fifth gas giant when it was really young. So there's Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus, or Uranus, Neptune really in that order. But the there was probably another ice giant, so another Neptune, Uranus type object in the solar system. And the reason why we think that is because if you simulate the planets and like let them, you know, orbit around super fast, you speed up the simulation, uh, very often Neptune gets kicked out of the solar system altogether mm -hmm. uh, through gravitational attractions with Saturn and Jupiter especially. Um, so the way to solve that problem, because obviously the Neptune's here, is to add another gas giant and then that guy gets kicked out and that saves Neptune and Uranus. So we think even the solar system, we probably ejected not just tiny rocks, but entire planets at the, at the freaking solar system. So there are literally rogue worlds drifting between the stars, you know, which might even have moons and even maybe there's life on those things. It's pretty wild to think about. So there's definitely ways that can happen. Another good example is Triton, uh, Triton around Neptune. So Triton is a moon which goes backwards around Neptune, which is kind of weird. Yeah, why does it go backwards? Well, for a long time, people were like, that doesn't make any sense. Like if it's forming, it should form as the planet forms, it should spin in the same way the planet spins. None of this makes any sense. But then this uh, brilliant astrophysicist, Craig Agnor, came up with a, a mechanism to explain this. And you basically have two, uh, like a binary object. So you have Triton, and it has a, another body next to it. And these two objects just orbit around each other like a binary. And we know of loads of binaries like this in the asteroid belt. So there's this binary of, of, that, that swings closer and closer towards Neptune. And then what's happening is at the moment of close approach, Triton is on the inside and it's moving at almost the same speed as Neptune. So they're kind of like, it's like two cars down the highway that are moving at 70 mm. miles an hour and 71 miles an hour. You can kind of look through each other's windows and see each yeah. other and it looks kind of slow. And so that means that Neptune can gravitationally capture the moon and grab onto it. Whereas the other object is going the other direction. So that's like the car going the opposite highway direction. Yeah. That's going 70 miles an hour in the other direction. So that's doing like 140. So that thing just gets slingshot super fast and gets kicked out of the solar system altogether. So this mechanism we think explains how you can form some of the moons, including Triton. So there are probably these binaries which also kick. So maybe 3A Atlas, maybe Oumuamua used to be in a pair and they got too close to another planet and one of them became a moon and the other guy oh, got chucked out. Yeah, that's that's a pretty easy way Possible. of making these. Yeah, right. You know, we don't know for sure, but that's one easy way of doing it. When you talk about, I believe you said it was Neptune when we run these simulations could be kicked out of the yeah. solar system. How long, like, let's say we notice one day, oh, they're getting kicked out. And you can see it's like point and no return. How long does that simulation take for it to actually leave the solar system? Are we talking days, years, hundreds oh, of years? Millions and millions, millions of years. Millions of years. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, to, to these speeds are very slow. So, I mean, it's going a similar speed to Voyager 1, Voyager 2. And it will take Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, I think, something like uh, 100,000 years or so to reach like the nearest star. So that, yeah, you're, you're tr these are very slow speeds, time. but the galaxy is very old. So there's like plenty of time for these things to make their way. And then within a, another thing I was just thinking about, within our solar system, obviously like, you know, there's planets that we're trying to figure out if at some point we could reach, but they're so far away. You know, are there definitive cases to be able to say that not necessarily aliens or something like that, but there's some life on Jupiter, for example, can, and, and how do we know that? It depends what you mean by on Jupiter, because Jupiter doesn't have a surface. So, so like, what's the on mean? It, it would probably have to be like hanging out in the clouds, right. just like floating around. And people have speculated about that. Scientists have speculated about that. I think Carl Sagan actually thought about that quite a bit and was, you know, wondering there could be life in the clouds. It's been suggested for Venus, that's true. So uh, a few years back, there was a detection of a molecule called phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. And on Earth, phosphine is pretty much only made through life, you know, through these, um, happens on like bays and shorelines. There's this bacteria. Mm. It kind of, it's, I think it gives that truffle smell. Actually, no, that's DMS. It's like, yeah. So anyway, it's a molecule which is made by bacteria. And it was found in the atmosphere of Venus. Um, and it turns out, even though Venus is like a hellhole, the surface is like uh, 700, 800 Kelvin, so <sighs> extremely hot. Um, it's like an oven on the surface. So there's definitely no way you'd expect life to be on the surface. But as you go up and up and up, there is a certain layer 
where the pressure is similar to this room and the temperature is similar to this room. Mm. So it's possible there could be bacteria which are just wafting along in the clouds. Um, it's a little bit challenging how they stay up there. Like you need, you know, do they do they propel themselves somehow or is there wafts that just sort of keep them afloat mm. for, for their entire life cycle? I mean, it's a little bit speculative, but in principle, the conditions are right and uh, phosphine was detected. So people got excited about that. So I think people are, you know, scientists are open-minded about that possibility. It's not, it wouldn't be your first bet though, right? Because um, there's moons like Europa and Enceladus, which have like liquid water underneath their surface and the plumes and organic underneath molecules. The yeah. So we know obviously on the earth, the oceans are full of life. So mm -hmm. if you've got a giant ocean underneath these moons, it seems like that would be a more obvious place to find life since we know for sure that's a place where life can survive rather than saying, hey, the first place we should look is the clouds of Neptune because you require like two two or three miracles for that to work out. Right. Whereas you only require the same thing to have happened on Earth to have happened in, in these moons. So I think when we, you know, sometimes the public get frustrated with scientists like saying, why do you guys only care about, you know, Earth-like planets? And it's, it's not that we, we're narrow-minded. We don't think about life in strange places, like on the surface of neutron stars, even. People have speculated. Even the galaxy could be a living being. People have, Scientists have speculated about that. The entire galaxy could a be an organism. Being. Yeah. <laughs> that is like the last scene in Men in Black. Basically. Right, right, yeah. So it, scientists have very wild imaginations, trust me, about what is possible. That's good. But it just wouldn't be... If you're going to prioritize, hey, here's you know $10 billion NASA's got to, to look for life, you... You have to, you know, it's like stocks and bonds. Like, okay, maybe you put like 1% into your Bitcoin or something. I don't know what your portfolio is like, but you're probably going to like put, you know, some of the money in like the, the the high risk stuff, but not all of it. And then some, most of your money probably lower risk uh, right. investments. It'd be kind of radical to stick all in like the highest risk thing possible. You're trying to stick it to what you could relate to. Like, like a human being, like you said, couldn't live in like a cloud like atmosphere. They got to live on something that has somewhat similar resources in a way. So that's where yeah. you're going to look. It yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. And it's similar for, it's similar for stars. It's similar for planets. So yeah, we've got to, we've got to look at least, you know, the, the chances are good to look at places where we know for sure life was successful. Thank you guys for watching the episode. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button and smash that like button on the video. They're both a huge, huge help. And if you would like to follow me on Instagram and X, those links are in my description below.